And I'm going to read uh, the passage for today. So if you can either check on your Bible or look on the screen for John chapter 4. And I'll be reading from verse 42. John chapter 4, verse 42. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard from ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. After the, after the two days, he left for Galilee. Now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they also had been there. Once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick in Capernaum. When these men heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will leave. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, Yesterday, at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. I received the following email a couple of days from a close friend in the UK. They wrote, Dear family and friends, Some of you know that I have been in and out of hospital recently having tests for what turns out to be a brain tumour. The situation is as follows. The tumour is extensive and aggressive, and the doctors say they cannot remove all of it. Obviously, this has come as a huge shock for us and our family, but we are trusting Jesus, our Good Shepherd, who not only walks with us through the dark valleys, but has a purpose for every day of our lives until we meet him again in heaven. Now, here is someone who is firmly clinging to their faith in Jesus while death is knocking loudly at that, their door. And I start with this letter because we know that suffering will come. Uh, we know that in this life, grief will come. Perhaps some of you have already experienced this. Perhaps for some of you, this is in the future. But when you are in this moment, where will your faith lie? Well, this passage that Leo has just read for us is about the nature of faith. And we get to ride along with the royal official as we see him grow from a flicker of faith to a flaming faith. And that all happens in the furnace of faith. And it's my prayer that as we walk along with this passage, uh, we will be encouraged while our faith is deepened, strengthened and expanded as we marvel at the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. So let's turn now in our, to our passage as we start this journey by looking at the flicker of faith. Now Jesus had just returned, as we heard, uh, from, to Galilee, from Jerusalem via Samaria, where, where many had come to faith in him simply through his words. They hadn't seen any signs, and he came back to Galilee. And verse 47 tells us that a royal official had heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea and he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. And now there are two things that I want to draw out from this verse about the flicker of faith. And the first one, friends, is a little bit surprising. And the first thing I want to draw out about the flicker of faith is it isn't a blind faith but it's a faith based 
on reason. This man didn't walk 38 kilometers up the hill from Capernaum to Canaan just to ask some random stranger to heal his son. And do you see that the passage points out that he specifically sought out Jesus? He'd most likely heard some reports from Jerusalem, from friends coming from Jerusalem about this guy called Jesus who had been performing these healings whilst over the Passover. And then he considered these reports and he also considered who brought the reports to him. And as he weighed the evidence, he then set out to seek Jesus' help. Now this flicker of faith didn't start with blind faith, but it started with thinking. It started from a place of reason. Well, second, this passage teaches us that the flicker of faith can be sparked by desperation. Uh, if it wasn't for his son's helpless state, uh, this man probably never would have sought Jesus out. Uh, the great preacher, English preacher Charles Spurgeon once said these words. He said, sometimes it's on the back of the black horse of desperation that God's mercy rides. And friends, you may be here today feeling that black horse of desperation. That's maybe why you're tuning in this morning. The last four months of lockdown have brought you to this space. And whatever your desperation is, uh, be it physical, psychological, financial, or relational, God wants you to bring it to Him. Cry out to Him. Uh, lay whatever it is before Him. Bring it to His feet and ask for His help. But as you do, you need to be prepared. Because God often doesn't answer us in the way we expect, but he answers us in the way we need. And this is what the royal official is about to find out as his flicker of faith is forged in the furnace of faith. Uh, do you know how they uh, purify gold in the first century? Uh, they purify gold in the first century by pouring the gold into a furnace and heating it up uh, so that the impurities of the gold bubble to the surface and then they skim those impurities off to purify the gold. Well, well this is a little like what Jesus is doing for the royal official. Uh, he turns up the heat to expose the royal official's impurities in his faith, to, to transform him from a flicker of faith to a life-giving faith, a flaming faith. And we see him turning up the heat with Jesus' surprising response to the man in verse 48. Now this man has just come to Jesus and said, Jesus, can you heal my son? And Jesus says in verse 48, he says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. Now can you imagine being the man there? He's like, that's not what I was expecting. I wasn't expecting you to answer in that way. That's a bit harsh, isn't it, Jesus? But as we dig into this passage, we see that Jesus' response is actually full of love. He's seeking to draw this man out. He's seeking to draw out the impurities of his faith and expand and deepen his faith, a little bit like Jesus did for the Syrophoenician woman in Mark chapter 7. And friends, the lesson for us here is that sometimes Jesus won't answer us how we expect, but he always answers us how we need. He may be wanting to draw us out, draw us into the furnace of faith, to expand our faith so that it's a faith that's a living faith, a growing faith, a deep faith, a sure faith, a secure faith. And James, Jesus' younger brother, sums it up like this. He says in James 1 verse, verse 2, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now friends, I pray 
that when we are in this place, when we're in the furnace of faith, when Jesus hasn't answered us as we wanted him to or we expected him to or we desired him to, I pray that we wouldn't walk away and walk away from Jesus. I pray that we would turn towards him, push into him, lean into him and seek the deeper lessons that he's he's wanting to teach us. And this is exactly what the royal official does. Look with me at verse 49. He says, Sir, come down before my little child dies. This official's faith is starting to form in the furnace. But Jesus has another lesson for him to learn in the furnace of faith. And that is that we can't come to Jesus on our own terms. Have you noticed up until this point, the royal official has been approaching Jesus on his own terms? If you look at verse 47 and 49 at his two requests, he's been asking Jesus to come down to heal his son. He assumed, like everyone else probably in his day, that Jesus had to be there to conduct the healing. He didn't know. That Jesus was in Canaan, the very same town that Jesus, with his words, had turned water into wine. Uh, This royal official was not like the centurion in Luke 7, who simply had faith that Jesus' words were enough to heal his servant. Now, this royal official, in his request, limited Jesus, came to Jesus on his own terms, And in doing so, in his mind was limiting Jesus' power and how Jesus could work. Now friends, I need to ask us, are there times in our life where we're doing the same thing? Where we've made assumptions about Jesus and then we are limiting what he can do? Does our prayer life reveal how we make assumptions about Jesus' power and limit what he can do? Are there things that we've just given up praying for because we think that they are beyond what Jesus can do? Well, it's these misguided assumptions that Jesus often breaks down in the furnace of faith. And this is what he does in verse 50. Jesus says to the man, Go, your son will live. Now, Jesus asked this man at this moment to step out in faith without a sign. He's seeking to move him from this rational belief, from his assumptions about Jesus, and moving him to a personal trust in Jesus as his Savior and in Jesus' word. And this step from rational faith to personal trust is often illustrated by preachers by sharing this story of Charles Blondin. You may have heard this story before. Uh, Charles Blondin, he was a a famous French acrobat. Uh, He became famous in 1859 for being the first person to cross the Niagara Falls on a tightrope. He got so good at crossing the Niagara Falls, he did it with a blindfold. Uh, He did it on stilts. Uh, One time he even sat down in the middle of the falls on the tightrope and cooked an omelette and ate it. Like This guy was amazing. And there was one time, rumor has it, that he pushed a wheelbarrow full of potatoes across the tightrope at the falls. And he got to the other side and he said to the crowd watching, he said, do you think that I could push a person across the falls like I've just done the potatoes? And the crowd excitedly said, yeah, we think we can do it because they'd seen what he had done. And then Charles asked them, he said, Who wants to hop in? Silence. No one came forward. No one was willing to make that leap from rational belief to personal trust. And this is what Jesus is calling this man to do. Do you trust me and my word enough to walk home? without a sign. He's asking him to live out his faith. 
And there's a challenge here for us, isn't there? To live out our faith. Are we willing with our whole lives to get in Jesus' wheelbarrow? Well, I know and I feel a lot of us struggle with this at different times in our life. Uh, we, we struggle to get in Jesus' wheelbarrow. Uh, we say things like, yes, I believe in Jesus. But deep down in our hearts, we know that we trust someone or something else. And we say, yes, I believe in Jesus, but we know that we trust money to save us. Or at different points in life, we say, I believe in Jesus, but we trust our relationships to fulfill us. Or we say, I believe in Jesus, but I trust my kids to bring me lasting joy. And so on it goes. Often, it's in the furnace of faith where Jesus starts to strip away these pseudo-saviors and calls us just to trust him for who he is. It's in the furnace of faith that we move from that rational belief to that personal trust in Jesus and his word. But I can hear someone sitting there at home thinking in their, in their mind, well, well, how much faith do I need? How much faith do I need to trust Jesus? Well, this passage reveals that we need just enough faith to take that first step. Verse 50 again. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. The man stepped out in faith without a sign. He stepped out in faith not knowing if his son was healed yet. Now, at this moment, his faith may have been small. But he was about to learn that the size of his faith didn't matter. It didn't matter because it's not about the amount of faith we have, but it's about where we place our faith, as he's about to learn in verse 51. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. What great news! When he inquired as to the time his son got better, they said to him, Yesterday, at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized, the light bulb went on, the father realized that this was exactly the same time which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. His son was healed immediately when Jesus said the word. It wasn't the official's faith. That saved his son, that healed his son, but it was whom he put his faith in. Now, I remember when we were over in New Zealand, um, we went uh, bungee jumping just out of Christchurch. And bungee jumping is one of those interesting things because you're putting a lot of faith in the bungee cord. I actually didn't go bungee jumping, I was too scared. But I watched my two sisters go bungee jumping. They have a lot more faith than I do. And as they jumped off, one had a lot of faith, one had a little bit of faith, but they both jumped. And it didn't really matter about the amount of faith they had, because both of them had placed their faith in the bungee cord, and it saved them. And that's how the Bible looks at faith. Some of us may have heaps of faith. Others of us may have a small amount of faith, but that really doesn't matter in the end. Because what matters is where our faith is placed. And if it's placed in the person and work of Jesus, then we can be sure and secure. Friends, it's in the furnace of faith that our faith expands. It's here that faith is forged. And it's the furnace of faith that turns our flicker of faith into a flaming faith. Did you see this transition for this man? The transition happens right at the end of our passage in verse 53. Uh, then, verse 53, then the father realized that this was exactly the same time at which Jesus had said, your son will live. Here's the verse. So he and his whole household believed. This moment changed this man's life forever. This moment changed his family's life forever. 
At this moment, he knew personally that Jesus could be loved and trusted. And he shared this news with his family, and they put their faith in Jesus too. Now, friends, I'm sure you're sitting at home, you're thinking, well, that's a great story. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have that same thing happen to us? Wouldn't it be wonderful to walk into church and say, here's my son who was sick, who Jesus healed, and here we are. Wouldn't it be wonderful if Jesus did the same thing for us? Well, friends, the reality is, he has. He has. Uh, Did you see the very last verse of our passage, verse 54? It said, this was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judah to Galilee. Uh, This was the second sign. Uh, The signs, as we look through them in John's gospel, are pointing to the sign of signs, which is Jesus' death and resurrection in our place. And I can't but help imagine, when, when Jesus said to this man, your son will live, when he said to this father, your son will live, he couldn't but be thinking of his own father. Jesus knew that the day was soon coming when God the Father would experience the anguish, the pain, the grief of losing his own son so that this official's son and his family could live. Jesus couldn't help but be thinking of himself. It was Jesus who could save those with a small amount of faith because the day was coming when he would faithfully die for all the times that we have been faithless. And and friends, it's here in Jesus on this firm and solid foundation in which we entrust our life. As the author of the letter of Hebrews puts it, they write, 12 in chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that, that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. As we begin to see Jesus in this light, as we grow through the trials, tests, and sufferings that this life will inevitably bring, As we begin to see his faithfulness to us, we will begin to love him for who he is, not just what he can do for us. Friends, this is the faith that my friend with the tumor has. This is the faith that the royal official understood through the furnace of faith. And I pray that this is the faith that you and I will have, no matter what situation we're in. Not a flaky faith, but a flaming faith, forged through the fire of faith and resting on the firm foundation of our faith, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you are faithful even though we at times are faithless. We thank you that you faithfully went to the cross in our place, trusting your Father. Lord, we thank you that through that, you perfect our faith. We pray as another father cried out, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. We pray that you would continue to grow our faith, mature our faith, strengthen our faith so that we can be more and more like the one in whom we put our faith. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.